Ladies and gentlemen, it's March the 30th, 2016, and this is Daily Code episode 30 uh, with me, Chris. Uh, now, I may not be the most consistent streamer, and calling it Daily Code is hilarious because it's not daily, but um, here we learn to program better or just have fun learning stuff. Um, so today I thought I would have a look at some Laravel stuff because it's been forever since I've done any of that on video or tutorial, and I've been working on a thing for about three or four months now, um, which uses Laravel and does a lot of automation stuff. And I thought it'd be fun to look at. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, but before I get too far into coding, I wanna explain what this thing does because it's uh, it's an interesting pet project of mine. Um, let me get a new window here. Yay, there's a Google thing. Okay, so this project um, started off as a way to help fellow Silver Stripe community people. Um, and uh, the way that, that it does that is it analyzes their modules um, according to like a set of criteria. So if we go to uh, silverstripe.org, let's see, supported module standard. Oh, a Google error. That's, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> Silver... <laughs> stripe.org. I'll go search for it there because apparently Google is not the answer. Um, okay, so search. There's the supported module standard. And what it is, is a way for um, like a list of good things for modules to have. And amongst other things, uh, let's see, where's the, that link, that very long link. Um, Amongst other things, uh, there are recommendations for a kind of common folder structure, a recommended style guide, you know, uh, notes about minimum versions and things, and uh, just generally a list of good things to have in modules. But turns out many Silverstripe modules don't actually have all these things. Um, in fact, the average is quite low. So I started this thing to um, to run through modules and to suggest improvements to them for things that are easily automatable. Um, and I worked on this for a little while and uh, made a very, very rough version, which submitted a few hundred pull requests. Well, it didn't submit them, but it generated the code and then I reviewed each one and submitted pull requests. So it's not completely botting. But um, that worked well for a few hundred and it didn't really scale well. So I redid a lot of the code. In fact, I redid all of the code. Um, and it follows a general process. So um, what it will do is it will get modules from packages because there is quite a large selection. Let me get the browser up again. There's quite a large selection of Silverstripe modules on packages, about 1500 uh, in total. Let's see, does it give us a count of how many there are? Probably not. 105 pages that all match a search criteria, Silverstripe. There are about 1500 modules in the Silverstripe community and Packagist actually exposes this stuff. Uh, so I think you can say .json, if this is the URL, I'd be surprised. Uh, no, search.json, that's that's quite funny. Anyway, oh well, something like this. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's some kind of API that's pretty easy to use, yeah, uh, yeah, whatever. And you can very easily get a list of the packages on packages. Okay, so this is the wrong URL structure, but I have it. Uh, I have it in code. Let's have a look. Um, let's see. Config. Mm, where did I put this? Oh, packages. It's right in front of me. Hello. Open that. Okay, so um, for instance, I've got two search criteria here, and the first says, "Get me everything that has the silver stripe tag." And so you can hit this up. Okay, I wasn't. I wasn't actually that far off. There was no API to packages. But anyway, um, it'll give you a list of modules and then you can get the URL for them. So this is a good way to see modules that are published as Silverstripe modules. And that's what I did. I, um, uh, I got a list of these modules and then what I would do is I would fork them to a public account and um, then download the code and just via like a git clone and then run some checks on them. So I check, or I do transformations for PSR2, or 
uh, see if they had a license file or stuff like that. And uh, that got me like quite far through being able to um, suggest improvements to community mod uh, community member modules. But then I redid the code to start doing this more efficiently because I had started off just trying to get something functional, like it didn't have to be good code, didn't have to be amazing structure or like super scale because it was just something I was doing in my free time. And, um, and I had all these processes. It was basically like a big old console application that I first wrote by stitching um, PHP, like just normal PHP modules together, not using a framework or anything. And it would run through these processes just in one continuous, uh, one continuous script execution, which is fine if you're running it in the background all day and just doing other work. But the more time I spent on it, the more I was finding I had to go back and restart processes and build all these mechanisms in place to be able to you know, start them at a certain point or like accommodate errors so that I wouldn't have to restart them the whole time. And it got quite complex and unwieldy. So I rewrote it using Laravel, uh, which is cool. It's been working really well. Um, and the last couple of days, I've decided to do a third iteration on this code. And that's kind of, I'm in the middle of doing that. And I thought it would be fun to do this because we've got, um, at Silverstrap, we have hack days the first Friday of every month, which basically means we get to work on something that's not, uh, that's not client work focused. Um, unless we want to, but we can work on a project that would improve our skills or help the company in some way, um, like passion projects sort of things. Uh, and this is what I wanted to work on. And I actually wanted to show this to people and get other people to contribute as well. So in order to do that, I wanted to make something wonderful. Uh, so far, I've managed to go through the, I've managed to redo the command that fetches all the modules. From packages, so it's a Laravel command, but the logic's pretty portable from console uh, library to console library. Mm. Um, and it looks it looks like this. So uh, Laravel commands have um, have like a signature that you give them with any arguments and parameters in that string, but the fetch is just a very simple one uh, and a handle function. And then uh, this one goes through and makes sequential requests. So you can specify searches that your application will do. I've tried to make this in such a way that other people could use it for their community modules, and it's not just a silver stripe thing. So there's a config, uh, there's a config file for specifying the packages searches that you do, and this command will go through each of those, start off with page one, and just sequentially request uh, lists of modules from packages according to those search URLs. Now the packages API has uh, has a next parameter. So if I if I go back and I open one of those one of these search results in here, um, one of the parameters is next. So this is a cursor based pagination system. Uh, it's not that it shows you. It does say the total, so you can infer the pages, but you don't have to. You can use next and just keep on chaining requests, which is what I do in the script. Um, I'll fetch the first page, which I know the URL of, and then I'll just follow the next parameter until I've gotten to the end of the list, uh, which is cool, which works really well. Um, so I'll do this for each search. I'll go through all the pages until there are no more next links. Uh, I'll decode the response for each. And if there is an error, then I'll just, you know, give a console warning or whatever, but I'll decode the response for each and then go through the results and we'll dispatch a job. Um, today was my first, uh, before the show anyway, was the first time that I spent, uh, first time in recent history that I spent a lot of time with the QJob stuff and it's really improved since last I used it a lot. Um, essentially you can set up QJobs, I, I basically haven't used it much since version 5 of Laravel framework. So anyway, um, I've set up a couple of jobs using the console make command. I think you can go, let's see, err. Uh, that's not the right one. That's the right one. I think you can go PHP artisan um, make job and then it'll complain because I haven't given a name. But when you do this, it will create this file in the jobs folder and give you some uh, some bootstrap code. So you can just fill in the handle method of this job. And the way that it sets it up, you can use a trait on your 
console commands called dispatches jobs, which gives you this dispatch as a method, and then you can dispatch those jobs to a queue. Now, by default, Laravel on local um, just does a synchronous queue. So you hit, you say this dispatch with a job, and it will do that immediately. It'll process that in the same thread, which is which is okay if you're debugging stuff. But when you're using high traffic production systems, you actually want to send that off to a different queue. So there you can change queue settings to be able to say, let's let's go to the queue config file. You can use quite a few different kinds of queues. Null just just bins the job. Uh, sync is the one that you will use uh, by default on local, and that will process them synchronously immediately. Uh, you can put queues in the database. You can send them to Beanstalk, Amazon SQS, and Redis. And then uh, if you do any of these four, any of the external services, then there is another artisan command you can say called queue listen. There's nothing in the queue, so it's not actually going to process anything, I think. No, it's not. Okay, so it doesn't actually say anything. But when I have a message in here, it'll process that. Uh, so this is useful if you're distributing the work. You put the jobs in the queue on your main thread, and then a different worker process picks that up. And if you're using a service like Laravel Forge to host uh, or to provision your servers, then that's really easy to set these things up. Anyway, I'm going to leave it sync for now because that works well on local. Um, but I've redone this first job, which fetches modules from Packagist, uh, which is great because it'll put jobs in the queue and then that fetch, uh, fetch, 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 where's that task? Fetch module job. Uh, we'll accept the module and serialize this. And then when it picks it up in the queue, uh, in the worker that processes this queue, it'll start to dissect this. It'll take the array that it got from Packagist and um, it'll look for a user that matches that module name. If, if it doesn't find it, it'll make that. And then it'll look for a module that matches that module name. So this is a way of, it's kind of like a find or create, um, but as relates to modules fetched from a third party service. Uh, if the user exists, or if the user doesn't exist, it'll make the user. If the module doesn't exist, it'll make the module. And then it'll save the data it gets from Packagist to this uh, module table. And that, oh, I don't even have my database uh, thing up. Oh, and I'll have to restart the database. Oh. <laughs> I just restarted. Ooh. Just restarted, so I've got to start all the stuff up again. Yay, okay. Now I should be able to connect. And helpful robot. And module. So what I did uh, a little bit earlier just to test that this works, because I set up migrations for the first time today on this project as well. It's really like I'm really going to town on this on this uh, automated ocean, automation thing. Um, I fetched a few packages from Packagist, and then I just cut the script. So there should be, I mean, there's only seven users here, but there should be around 300 different module providers and around one and a half thousand modules in this table. So I stopped it very early because I didn't want to go through all the hassle of doing that stuff. Um, this is just some testing data. So I get the module array from Packagist. I create some uh, class, uh, some database records and update those with the details of the module from Packagist. This is done. And I can dispatch these jobs and the queue will pick them up and process them. That's really cool. The next command I did was uh, I added or I reworked the fork command. So previously this would fetch all module records and go through each and clone them to the local machine and set up some settings. And it's still getting all the modules and essentially doing that. But now instead of doing all that work inline, it's going to create jobs to fork each module. And this is where QJobs starts to pay off because I'm not doing a lot of work in the main thread anymore, unless I'm on local and I'm testing with a synchronous queue. Uh, there is this fork module job, which is what that command uh, sends instructions to. And this will create the first inspection for each module. Um, it'll rename the fork to something safe. So I take all the modules from other people. For instance, uh, for instance, this this GitHub repo is Silverstripe. I'll make this a little bigger so you can see. Silverstripe slash Silverstripe dash PostgreSQL. And um, 
the package's name is Silver Stripe PostgreSQL. So I clone this repo to the public account, and then I take this name, and I just replace everything that's non-alphanumeric with a hyphen. So this ends up looking like, uh, I'm not even logged in with the account, so I can't show you, but this ends up looking like Silver Stripe dash PostgreSQL, which is which is fine because it's it's pretty clean. Um, when there are so many forks to deal with, that's that's a pretty good way to go. So I rename the fork if it's not already renamed, and then I clone it to the local system. And this essentially does a lot of exec stuff. Um, so the, the where do I create the, I create the inspection record, the first inspection record, and this is just to tag, um, this is just to create an inspection that's linked to the module and set the upstream and the origin of the module so that I know where to clone and where to push and all that stuff. Then I fork it to the public account, as I mentioned. Um, and yeah, when I rename the fork, I actually check for my preferred name. If that URL doesn't exist, then I do the request to rename the fork. So I'm not sending uh, superfluous GitHub requests to the API, which is cool. And then cloning the fork, as I said, is a lot of exec commands. So, I mean, there's lots and lots of exec stuff going on here. I remove the existing, uh, whoa. So if the folder doesn't exist or the lock file is there, um, it means that I haven't cloned this yet or I was in the process of cloning it and then the, and then the script died. In which case, um, I make sure the lock file is there uh, because if this returns true, then it's good to have that lock file there. I make sure the lock file is there. I remove any in progress stuff that was there before and I clone to the folder. So I clone the fork that I've created down to my local system. I set the username and the email according to some config things just so that I push to the correct place uh, or with the correct credentials. And then I reset the remotes. So I change the origin to the local forks origin, I change the upstream to where the fork is from, and I fetch the upstream just to get a working version of master. So this will be, you know, if someone set the default branch to something else, then this will reset or this will make sure that master is accessible so that future commands can check out master. And then I just remove the lock file. So that's how, how all that stuff works. Um, and both these commands I've created, I've created separate tasks from. Now, I want to go into a little bit more detail than I ordinarily would about the task at hand because I actually plan on doing tomorrow's stream on this topic as well. And I'm not going to go into such great detail then because I've done so now. Um, but I think now that you have some idea about how this is working and where I'm going to go next, um, it's a really good time, I think, to take a break. So I'm going to do that quickly and I'll be back in just two minutes. So stick around and listen to some music. I'll see you now.